tell me about the um, the Step Up campaign and why you got involved. Yeah, um, well, so I've been involved with the March of Dimes, um, well, technically since 2004, but my mom would say that I've been involved since I was born. I was born a month early, premature, um, and I spent 10 days in the NICU. And um, the reason why I Step Up campaign is happening this year is because so much of March of Dimes fundraising comes from uh, the in-person marches, the walks and everything around the country. And obviously with um, social distancing and no large gatherings, that's not happening. So they started this step up campaign. And then full disclosure, m my mom has been working for the March of Dimes since 2004. Um, and it was really a call to her passion. And, and now especially assisting people expecting giving birth in this time of COVID even more so my wife and I are expecting a baby boy at the end of July. So it's all just kind of, it's all hitting home, I guess is, is the best way to say it. So that's exciting. So this yeah. summer, yeah, this summer, just in time for training camp, just in time <laughs> to go back to work. <laughs> Hopefully we go back to work. So, well, tell me, you, you know, you and Ashley are trying to get out and get some exercise and, and, but you know, with you guys uh, locked up the way they are and we all are, but as a professional football player, what are you doing to, to stay in shape or to try and get into some kind of shape as the summer comes closer? Yeah, I mean, we're doing our best. A lot of, you know, 30-minute workouts in the basement, doing body squats and, and that kind of stuff. And um, part of the, the NFL's handlings with this is they, um, they allowed teams to send um, some workout equipment to guys. So we actually just got that shipment from the Seahawks. Uh, so I got a weight vest and a medicine ball and all sorts of bands and things to do that. But it's tough. I mean, it's tough. It's tough for anyone. I mean, a lot of people have, you know, had gym routines and now they're stuck at home trying to scrounge up, you know, stationary bikes or weight racks and stuff like that. And um, it's tough for us. We haven't pulled the trigger on any really weight room equipment because we're planning on going back out to Seattle. Um, for her to deliver at the end of July. So we're going to be back there at the latest in early June. And um, so we're, we're doing our best push-ups, core work, band work. Um, it's tough. Um, open fields. There's a, another snapper that lives up here that I'll meet um, a couple times a week and we'll go just get some snaps outside on nice days. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, the thing is everyone's in the same boat. Some guys are, you know, they're, prepared with home gyms or they were able to find some equipment and um, we're just doing our best like everyone else is trying to get through this and stay safe at the same time and we'll see how it shakes out. You went at like four teams before it finally clicked with the Seahawks and yeah. that took so much that was a real testament to your character as a person and as a, as a football player. Uh, what do you credit the fact that you finally stuck like what made it click for you? There's a lot that goes into it so in the specialist world, kickers, punters, snappers, um, there's a lot of, obviously everyone's very skilled and good at their job and what they do. And there's a lot of luck and timing that goes into it. Um, maybe even more so for snappers, just because it's kind of a, it, it's a hard position to scout and put numbers to and, um, you know, give good, data to you know punters have hang time and distance and kickers make or miss from ranges and snappers it's kind of a, a gray area for a lot of people so it was you know it, I definitely so I'll say that when I came out I was just swimming treading water trying to stay afloat and it was just there's so many new things I was converting from being a tight end and a snapper in college to just being a snapper and there was so much to learn um, and that was one thing starting in New England probably the hardest place for a rookie to come in and start um, in their NFL career. And that taught me so much right off the bat. Um, and I, I wasn't ready that first year and it gave me another year of doing the workout circuits, visiting teams, seeing how coaches coach differently, new schemes, all that kind of thing. And then um, a couple preseason uh, years of getting some game film and then building up and then, my really the year that was different for me was um, I started the year uh, with the New York Giants and then ended up 
getting cut before the pre or before the regular season started and then um landed with the Bengals as a fill in for their snapper who got hurt and played three games there. And then that, once I got my three regular season games, it was like, okay, this, you know, they see a a guy that has game experience and can play. And then it was just, you know, waiting, waiting. I got released again. Um, Was thinking I was probably not going to play for that rest of the year. um, Cause that was November, late November, um, when I got released from the Bengals again and the Seahawks snapper got hurt in the week 17 game and they had worked me out previously that year and they brought me in for a workout and my first game with the Seahawks was the playoff game the first round playoff game against the Lions in 2016 um, so it was just like it so much had to line up and it was that's a funny story too that whole situation coming into the Seahawks because I was actually out, it was New Year's Eve, and I was out at a bar um, watching all the football games that were on that night, and we were at a friend's engagement party, and I actually saw when the snapper got hurt in Seattle, and I told my wife, I'm like, I don't think I can, I got to stop drinking, because I might be getting a phone call if this guy's really hurt, and lo and behold, we get home you know, a couple hours later, the game had only been over for 30, 30 minutes to an hour probably. And I got a call from my agent saying, you're flying to Seattle, pack your bag. You got a 7 a.m. flight. I was like, what? And then I got to Seattle and they signed me and they were playing on a Saturday game. So I got like three walkthrough practices before my first playoff game. So I was just thrown into, I was thrown into the fire. And I think that was honestly probably the best thing for me because there wasn't time to think. And you just go and you play and then um, came back the next year and competed for the, the job against the incumbent that was there that got hurt, um, won the job and haven't looked back. <laughs> Man, that's a good story. Like when you, when, I mean, where were you watching? What state were you in when you were watching the playoff game? I was back here in Boston. Okay. Um, so we were, at, we were at a bar called Yard House and uh, down in the Fenway area here. And um, we just, I happened to be, in the bar chatting, looked up and saw, you know, something going on with a snapper on the game. And, you know, immediately first thing you do is you go to Twitter and start looking up, you know, what happened and checked out the guy's name and just started reading. It was like snapper rolls ankle, comes back in, but can't really do much. And I'm like, uh, I think I have a feeling that something's about to happen. <laughs> okay, but, but like, why would you think like, did, I'm, unless I missed something, like why would you think, you would be going like, were you part of the Seahawks practice squad at that point? Or were you, did no. you have connections with the Seahawks or were you just thinking I'm an, I'm a long snapper with NFL experience and I'm free right now? Yeah. So um, that's definitely part of it. Just, I had the game experience. It had only been like two weeks since I got released from the Bengals. Um, so I was in shape. They have recent film. Um, but really I had the feelings because the Seahawks brought me in um, before week one of that season for a workout and the, you know, they, they call them workouts, but it's basically the NFL's version of an interview. So they bring you in and, you know, meet you, uh, put you through like a workout. So for me, it's just snapping and they watch, have you run a little bit, do some drills to see you move. And then they say, you know, thanks for coming out. You know, you're on our list in case, you know, something happens, a guy gets hurt or whatever. So emergency list. Yeah. Um, so I did, you know, I was doing a bunch of those. I probably did like 10 or 12 of those for my first two years, just flying to teams on Monday, doing a workout Tuesday morning and flying home the next and that afternoon. Um, and so it was just, everything kind of just lined up is that the Seahawks were interested in me um, at the beginning of the year. And then that happens at the end of the year, I was on their list and I was the guy they brought in. So Okay, so that was uh, a little bit part of it. Is that that? Yeah, a little context there, on yeah. their emergency list. So, man, that's good thinking on your part. Stop drinking and, and yeah. get your head right. <laughs> yeah. So it was, and it was good because they they were like, "You're on the 7 a.m. flight." The bad part is, I got there for my 7 a.m. flight, and it got delayed until like 2 p.m. or something. Oh. But I made it. I'm here now. So, <laughs> yeah. hey, listen, when you when you were a tight end in Harvard, you set the school record for touchdown passes in a game. It was a triple overtime loss to Princeton. Um, mm-hmm. First of all, do you still have that record? Do you know? 
Yeah, so I still hold, I actually, it's a share of the record. There's another, um, I forget the other, the other guy who's got it, but um, yeah, still, still shared the record for most touchdown passes in a game. Okay, so uh, what do you remember about that game? That it was a very bittersweet ending. <laughs> so, uh, no, it was crazy. Um, Princeton had battled us really hard in my career for whatever reason. We had some really, um, some really heartbreaking losses to them. And um, that game was at home. And my first, the first touchdown was in the third quarter, middle of the game somewhere. Um, the second one was a tying one to go to overtime. And then the third one was in overtime to go into, I think it was one of the double or triple overtimes, but um, it was just like everything just lined again, everything just kind of lined up in that game. I was back then I was, um, I was playing with uh, Cam Brate, uh tight end for the Buccaneers and Kyle Juszczyk, mm. uh, who's uh, the fullback in the Niners. Um, so surrounded by some good athletes. And I was back then I was used more of like, the fullbacks move around blocking. Um, so I just kind of like go to fake a block and flip out to the flat. And, you know, it was eight yards to the end zone when nobody was around. <laughs> so I made it in, but uh, no, it was unbelievable experience. And then I just wish, you know, it, it would have been a win instead of a loss. So the, the asterisk of the end of it is, is bittersweet. <laughs> that's still, that's, that's cool though, though, man. That's uh that's a good story too. The fact that, you know, the Harvard thing is another thing. Like, do, do a lot of guys, um, do they give you a lot of garbage when you show up or challenge you a little bit? Well, um, I'd say not so much anymore. Um, when I got to New England as a rookie, um, I was just kind of – I was known as Harvard. No one really called me by my name. Um, now it's like – now the, the funny thing about when I say I went to Harvard is it'll come up in casual conversation. It's like um, – someone will be asking a question and then the coach will be like, well, why don't you ask the guy that went to Harvard? And the guy will be like, you went to Harvard? Like, yeah. He's like, wow, you're smart, huh? Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I got a feeling yeah. that that had to have come, come back around a few times in your career. Please. Yeah. It's just funny. When we get new guys or when we get rookies, uh, someone will make like a side comment about me going to Harvard. And then someone will come up to me later in the locker room and just be like, do you really go to Harvard? Man. Yeah, I did. They're like, man, that's cool. It is cool. Like when you you went to high school in Oklahoma, right? So yeah, how did you wind up? You know, and without getting too deep in your career, but I do want to know this. Like, how how does yeah. a guy like you wind up going from Oklahoma high school to Harvard and playing football right away? Yeah, I mean, it was. Um, well, how it happened is, um, I was actually I actually verbally committed to play at Tulsa. Um, down the street from where I grew up and um, I had one day a Dartmouth recruiter came into I played for you know powerhouse um, Friday Night Lights big football program in high school so um, we always had recruiters coming from everywhere and there was a Dartmouth recruiter that came and I was a good student in high school and um, they sent me letters. They wanted me to come up for an official visit. And I looked up where Dartmouth is and it's in the middle of nowhere, New Hampshire. And I said, no, thank you. And, um, but it got me thinking, I was like, well, if, if Dartmouth came calling, why wouldn't the other Ivy? So I, I actually sent out my highlight film to all the Ivy league schools. And it was, it was crazy. It was, it was like within a week, Harvard got back to me and said they were interested in, and wanted me to come on an official um, and then once I got there, I was just, it just felt right. Um, my mom hated it going halfway across the country, but you can't say no to Harvard if they want you to go to Harvard. So, and that was what I, that's basically what I said. I'm like, I can't say no to this. Like if I say no to Harvard, I have to have a good reason. And with, you know, coach Murphy is still there coaching. He's man, I'm 28. He's been there for 29 years coaching at Harvard and, his whole thing was that every class that came through the Harvard football program has won a championship, at least one. And so all, they were always winning and um, it was good football, you know, and it was like, wow, it's the best of both worlds. In my opinion, there might be 11 guys in the league now, maybe 12 after this, this uh, year's draft class came out. Um, and so we leave the Ivy league 
by a handful of guys um, with guys on teams out there right now. So we've got something that they like. That's true. Uh, do certain holders want that ball spun faster or in different locations or how many requests do you get or is it pretty much a standard deal? Uh, yeah, everybody's a little different. Um, you know, some guys like for field goals, they like it more like eye level. Some guys like it a low, lower, like right over the spot. Um, some guys are more comfortable catching it more into their body because they have a, you know, a, a backboard, you know, if they were to, it, for it to go through their hands or something, it's not going to fly back 10 yards or something. And, um, but it's all, it, it, I would say it's not, it's, everybody's unique, but it's all pretty, you know, there's a strike zone. There's always a strike zone. So it's just kind of weird if they like it in the upper left corner or the bottom right corner of the strike zone. So um, punts is pretty standard. Everybody kind of wants all the punters really want it right at their right hip. Um, and that's like the gold standard is a right hip snap. Um, so yeah, there's, there's other little unique quirks and things with the, the location is pretty, pretty standard other than little things like that. Yeah. But how far back is a punter? Uh, we stand at 14, 14 to 15. Okay. So that's, that's, that's a lot of ground you're making up to, to, to hit that target. Like, uh, you know, and I didn't know I, everybody who watches on TV thinks it just has to go right in the middle, but you're saying the sweet spot is over here to the, to the right. Um, yeah. is that something you, you must pride yourself on the target practice there at least? And you... yeah, I mean, it's, you know, well, Dixon's Dixon's really good about it. He, he doesn't really notice the snap as long as it's not something crazy out there, but you know, the, the perfect, the perfect snap is at the right hip. But like I said, the strike zone is like chest down to mid thigh. So anywhere in that range in, in the frame of the body is really a, a good snap. Um, when you see, when you hear like perfect snap competition is when you go right to the right hip. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the gold standard. That's exciting to see. Um, not always realistic in certain situations because there's a, there's a lot of really good athletes trying to rush you and run you over and block the punt. So sometimes you got to just get it back there and block. But, How much can they can they make contact on? Because have they? It seems like the rules have backed off a little bit. Where, um, you know, they really can't mess with you too much as a long snapper. Yeah, that's a, especially so on field goal. On field goal, we're really protected now. They can't line up um, in the framework of my body inside my shoulders, and they can't um, if they make contact. Really, any kind of contact, they're supposed to throw a flag if they make any contact to my head or neck area. Um, for punts, it's a little different. They can't line the same thing. They can't line up on my framework, um, but they can. As soon as I snap, it's live. Um, they can rush through, run me over, whatever they want. That's usually not the best way of getting to to block a punt by running through the snapper. But if they wanted to, they can. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that. Uh, so, so, but there's a little bit less. Like, there's in your mind, you're not, and you still have to snap it and get it on target. But you also have to get ready to block too. So, yeah, that's, and that's one of the hardest things, especially one thing that when I came out of of college and went to new England is, um, college snappers really don't snap and block anymore. It's just the, the, the style of punts in college. So the, the biggest transition that's a struggle for guys is snapping and blocking. And then the speed is ratcheted up that much more in the NFL because everybody's, you know, the five-star athlete now, basically, um, so it's it's a it's tough. I mean, that's something that I'm constantly working on is snapping and how to get up the block faster. Um, the faster you can get up and block, the the easier it is to block because you're not holding on for dear life and just trying to slow them down enough. You can you can hopefully get ahead of them and um, you know push back instead of just try to slow him from going forward. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I got to ask you about Dixon. Is he is you know that 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 play in Detroit a few couple of years ago when he took off running? Um, you know when you watch it as a snapper and you're just like, you, <laughs> that I want to ask you about that. What was your reaction when he when he just took off running? Uh, confused. <laughs> um, 
I, I didn't know, I didn't think he got the first down. And I was just like, I was like, what just happened? I'm looking around. Like, I, it's funny when we, every time that it gets brought up and we watch the film or something, I'm walking down the like sideline, just looking around, like, what just happened? Um, there's a funny story with that. Um, so coach Carroll loves to just come up with ideas and just throws it out there. And, um, Dixon having played Aussie rules football is he likes to think he's a little bit of an athlete. So coach one day says like, Hey, wh when are you just going to run one of these punts, you know, just catch it and see that no one's rushing and just take off. And so that was at the start of like in training camp or something. So we fast forward to Detroit and what do you know, he just sees no one's there and he's trying to run to the corner and just takes off. I mean, it was crazy. I mean, I mean he humble unbelievable the end zone he picks his own end zone to to, to, to enact this uh this wild idea yeah so it was yeah yeah oh, crazy yeah that's like everybody always asks that question still it's amazing yeah, I bet. that might that might be right now well he's an all pro pro bowl so rookie year he might he might be over that now but that might be the defining play of his career so far you know what man i, I think you're probably right when people look back at his career that's going to got to be his number one highlight i mean just yeah the back of a leg and, and everything he does punting wise but man yeah that was just well, looking back at john ryan too his defining play was the fake field goal in that nfc championship game against the packers i mean if you see a john ryan highlight it's 100 it's 99 of the time it's of that play so <laughs> that's right that's a good point hey one last question for you so you're so good at what you do and and, and you rarely see and i don't can't even recall a bad snap from you but in your career, um, college or pro, did you ever have a snap that just went awry and, and it sticks in your head as, man, that was just a horrible snap or, or was it weather-related yeah. or anything like that? Does anything stick in your mind? Um, I'd say really, um, this is going back even further, um, I snapped in high school too. And that's really the last, you know, I hate saying that, but knock on wood, that's the last time I've had one that really stuck with me. Um, we were playing our high school rivals, which in Oklahoma is a big deal. And um, we had a field goal to win, or we had a PAT to win, and I rolled it back, <laughs> and we missed the PAT. <laughs> so we go to overtime, and we end up losing and um, that one stung. So I still think about that. That's the one that comes to mind when I get asked a question. But, you know, everybody has – I've had a couple bad snaps in the NFL. Luckily, none of them have resulted in a block or um, a completely missed field goal. But um, that's the one that sticks. But ever since then, I've been strong. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, it didn't affect your career at all, but, but it is kind of like a guy like you. Were you a senior in high school when you did that? No, I was a uh, – what was that? I was a sophomore, and that we actually – so the light at the end of that tunnel is that we actually played the same team in the championship, and we won. Yeah. So, so we won the state championship that year after all that. Redemption coming back at the end. <laughs> so, <laughs> I can't picture you rolling one back, but you're just a sophomore yeah, high school, man. What did you want? Yeah, all right. You know? I mean, hey. How big were you as a sophomore? Uh, I was probably 220, 220, 225, and still about 6'3"-ish. Six, six, yeah, 6'4". As a sophomore? Yeah, they grown yeah. bigger down there. Yeah. Big dude. Yeah, I showed up uh, my senior year. My senior year, I was probably a little lighter, probably like 215, 220. My senior year of high school, I was like 235. And then I reported to Harvard at 250 my freshman year after that. So, Wow. But man, then I've been, st I've been steady at 250 ever since. I found man. my weight. <laughs> man, that's good. All right, Tyler, yeah. it's been a pleasure, man. Thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing you. Thanks, Paul. Looking forward to getting back.